Okay. Hey, everyone. Back for a fourth time. Man, I am like so honored and humbled that you're back for a fourth time. Uh, we got the awesome Ryan Serhant with us. In case you're unaware of what who, who Ryan is, he's a real estate broker and CEO, founder of Serhant, a vertically integrated mega brokerage comprising an in-house film studio, education, marketing division, technology platform. His YouTube channel, I just noticed, is at over a million subscribers, and the content is awesome there. He's a best-selling author, producer, star of Million Dollar Listing, New York, sell it like Sir Hunt. And his new book, which I breezed through in like two days because it's so fun to read, is Big Money Energy. Go to BigMoneyEnergy.com, buy the book. It's so much fun. Sell it like Sir Hunt was so fun. This is just like a sequel, I feel like. It's like a continuation. I just love the storytelling. It's awesome. Thanks for being here, man. Thank you for having me, guys. You guys are the best. Um, uh, this is always awesome. And all of your members and everyone who joins is, is always really, really cool to talk to. Great questions. So it's an honor to be here from Tribeca. Yeah. Nice. Awesome, dude. dude. Well, let's well, kick thanks. it off. Thanks for being on, bud. Your book, your books, or two books, always feel like like you're taking us along for the for some type of ride and a painful a painful ride laughing at my pain it's really that's what I, that's what i love about it it feels so real and you make fun of it too like, yeah. like just the beginning of the book when you're talking about going through with the producers in new york and having to leave early i was like that's that's cool and you don't get a lot of insight from other people like that and you're very relatable so i have a question what made you decide that telling your stories was the best way to get your point across instead of doing it the other way that other authors do? Yeah, I, I, I sat there for a second um, during quarantine and thought about doing more of like a, you know, like a Gary V type, you know, almost like a, you know, anthology book where if I'm going to write about how to be successful and how to gain success and how to build confidence, let me just go interview and I could do it through Zoom because everyone's home because I wrote this whole thing during quarantine. A bunch of people who are successful and confident and let me get their stories and put it together. And then, you know, um, they weren't nearly as interesting as mine. <laughs> so it just uh, it just turned into, and, you know, I, I don't know. I think I can write so personally about what I've been through. And it's also about what I've learned, right? So it's, I, I'm putting this book out there just like Salt Lake Sirhan. So people can learn from my mistakes and they can get further in their career a whole lot faster learning from what took me years and years and years and years and years to do. Um, whereas like, if I'm just writing a library book about other people, I mean, might as well just go check out Wikipedia, you know? And so it just didn't seem interesting to me. So I'd rather be super vulnerable and really embarrass myself in the written word. But you do that in no, such I a classy way, bro. So good job on that. Well, the reason I love, I mean, it's the storytelling you know, is something we all can relate to because, you know, people look at you, Ryan, and they're like, oh man, he's selling $20 million homes. And that's so not what we do and this, that, and the other. But what I love about it is it allows us to realize whether you're selling a $40 million home or a $400,000 home, the situations are all very similar. And Always. it's a refreshing to hear that you've gone through everything that we have gone through, you know? Yeah, man. I, that's, Listen, I, I, I think one of the big misconceptions people have about me and our company is that we don't just work with the wealthiest people in the world. I mean, we do, but our bread and butter are, you know, regular New Yorkers who happen to be able to afford big, expensive homes, but they, you know, they are workers, right? They have 2.2 kids. They are trying to just, you know, figure life out one step at a time. Um, uh, and so we're doing, I think we just got an accepted offer on something for $400,000, you know, on the far Upper East Side in a walk-up co-op, you know, and at the same time, we're doing deals for $4 million, uh, $7 million, two for $7 million. Um, just submitted an offer on something for 16 and we've been doing a lot in Florida. So we're like, <clears throat> we're all over. We're, we're client first, right? The brokerage is agent first more than anything. And, uh, and then, you know, our, our culture is client first above all. You know, we, we, I sold a big place in Palm Beach that closed last week and, um, uh, that client started as a rental. I saw that, dude. Can you tell a story about that one? Because I was reading the article on that one. I love it. Was it where was the article? New York Times or something? Wall Street uh, Journal and everywhere else, I think. Um, yeah. So in the beginning of January, up with this shit, Nick. Come on. 
Sorry, dude. Sorry. Wall Street Journal. Sorry, my bad. In the beginning of uh, January, I was connected to um, somebody who was looking to rent a place in the city on the Upper East Side. Um, and he was really looking to rent like an office more than anything. He didn't want an office building. He just wanted to rent like a townhouse or something that he could work from. You know, he's a, he's a finance guy um, and he just couldn't work from home anymore. He was going to, he was driving him completely insane. And so we showed him a bunch of rentals. He found one he liked. We took a lease out. Remember, New York City is 70% rental. Okay? Um, and then he just started talking to him about, you know, what he's thinking and, you know, why, why are you still in New York City? You don't go to the office anymore, but you can stay here. Like your kids are still zooming into school. Um, uh, we started talking about Florida because we've been doing a lot in Florida. Um, uh, uh, you know, we started talking about taxes and the tax savings. And, you know, if you're in a certain income bracket, you move to Florida, you can save 14% on your income tax. There's no capital gains tax. And then if you stay there until you die, there is no state estate tax, at least not right now. Um, the property taxes in Florida are really high, but it, it's not anywhere near what you pay in income tax. Um, and so he's like, all right, dude, send me some stuff. Send me stuff you got in Florida. Like, okay. So I sent him stuff between Miami, Palm Beach. Um, uh, we looked at them and I sent him a total wide range. I was like, what do you want? He's like, I have no idea. I don't know the values. I don't know anything about the air. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's like, okay, well, you can afford a lot. So I sent him things from five to $50 million just to see, just to see. Um, and he only <laughs> liked the most expensive things. He's like, what else, what else, what else? The good so range. Back and forth. The what? That's a great range. Yeah. yeah, just send him everything. Just send him everything. You know. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> um, and then I did, if you guys remember from Salt Lake Sirhan, uh, and to anyone who takes the, the Salt Lake Sirhan course, um, uh, you know, I, I did the wow moment. Like, everything I talk about in the course in the books, it's just, it's, it's like my life and I do it. So none of this is, is bullshit or, or made up. I just like write what I know. So the wow moment is when I, I, I have a buyer and I, I show them or take them to an apartment that they, that I think they can't afford. Right. But I wow them with it in order to then bring them back down to reality. And then I push their budget just a little bit to get them to actually close. Otherwise, if I just show them houses that they tell me they want or houses that are in their budget that they told me, then they're going to look for like four months if they can. Right. Or there's going to be too much pressure to buy right now. The bidding wars. No, no, let's just keep looking. The next one, it's going to come on the market. We're going to get it. They'll, they'll take forever. So this thing came on the market for $140 million um, <laughs> in Palm Beach on the ocean. And so I said that to him as at my wow moment. Um, and he said, that thing's insane. Let's go see it. Uh, uh, and so we flew down to Palm Beach on a Thursday morning. And with him, I knew that my timing had to be fast. Okay? It had to be quick. Um, he wasn't the type of person where I could show him 10 things and then wow him because his mind moves too fast. You know, he's a trader. He's like all over the place. Uh, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to start you at the best. And I never do that. I went totally on a limb. I'm like, let's start at this place, 535 North County Road, Palm Beach, right next to Nelson Peltz's place. Um, uh, let's go check it out. We go in and it's insane. Like, I have never seen a house like this ever. On the ocean, complete insanity. You're surrounded by billionaires. Um, uh, and we go up to the second floor. We're looking around and he takes me and he puts me up against the wall, um, <laughs> physically. And I'm all prepared for him to be pissed off. Like, hey, like, why would you bring me here? You know, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, where does this get done? Like, well, um, 120-ish? You know, I don't know. Fuck, I, it's, it's, the only house to ever sell for more money than that was Jeff Bezos, who paid David Geffen in LA last summer $165 million. Okay? I remember, dude. Wow. The, the second most expensive uh, single family sale is like 111. And then there's a couple in the hundreds ish, and then they drop down from there. So there's no comps, okay? Like Palm Beach on the ocean asked like 3,500 to $4,000 a foot. This house was asking $9,000 a square foot. Okay, no comps or nothing. I then, so we leave. I take them to a couple other houses that are between 20 and $75 million, uh, and they all suck. Even the thing for 75 needs to be torn down. Okay, we've got three more houses to see, three more. And he tells us to pull the car over. And he's like, no, I'm fucking done. I don't want to go see the others. It's a waste of time. Get me the first one. Like, uh-huh. Okay. Um, he's like, what do you think we should offer? I like eights. It's like, right. 
<laughs> one twenty-eight. And I was like, one eighteen. I was like, do it, oh. write it up. I'm like, okay, great. Um, meanwhile, I'm a New York City broker. Okay, right. I'm like Doc Hollywood running around Florida right now, um, <laughs> uh, trying to figure things out. The night before, though, and I can tell you before we went there, and I did this at the beginning of my career too. The way I instill confidence in myself before I go into situations with clients or anyone that I'm unprepared for is I prepare. And so just like my first buyers ever, I have, it's blocked. I can show you my phone. It's blocked out in my calendar that Wednesday, which is now three weeks ago uh, for three hours, memorize Palm beach. So I spent there before I flew down and I memorized everything, every street name, the school information, all the listings that are on the market, all the brokers names, all the closed comps, everything that's happened in the last year, what the market is doing right now, what the restaurants to go to are, what's the annual fee to get into the breakers club. What do you actually get with that annual fee? Absolutely everything. So that, he would never ask me, have you done business yet? Blah, 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 right? I could always just lead with information and that instills confidence, right? So I did the same thing, talked to him. We made the offer for 118. Um, and the next day by four o'clock, we had a contract signed, uh, done deal for 132,880,000. And it closed Ooh, no. all cash 10 days later. Ryan, I just want to say you made a lot of really great relatable points right there. Um, and I'm going to veer away from some of the questions that we have because I want to dig a little bit deeper into this. You said a lot of great things in the sense that like you are a New York City broker, right? You flew down to Florida. You know, you don't know the lay of the land. You don't know exactly, especially with a house this big, you know, what's, where do you start? What's the negotiation process like? You know, what are the brokers around here? How are they going to react? So you you decided just to like pour into everything there is about Florida real estate. Just get as much information as you possibly can for your client. And that's something we all can take a lot away from, right? Like, especially with all the disruptors out there trying to attack us, information will always be king. And as long as you can compile a, a, enough of it, your clients are going to stick with you. Would you say that that's you know, on point or, you know, what's your opinion on that? A hundred percent. When I first started and, you know, a big piece of sell like Sarhan and a really, really big piece about big money energy um, was, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to be a real estate agent. Um, I have no experience. Okay? Um, I'm not from here. I have no confidence. I am actually pretty self-conscious. I have brutal anxiety. Um, uh, I can't be like these guys and these women and these people who are crushing it, right? They have huge teams. They've been doing this. How will anyone ever take me seriously? Why would anyone ever work with me? What do they have that I can actually get? And so I went on showings, right? Like broker previews, open houses. And I studied these agents who were successful, who were doing lots and lots of deals. And what I saw was they just talked about the deals they'd done over and over and over. Like that is broker tip number one, like all they would do is talk about the deals they've done. And it was kind of annoying, but what it showed was that they've been doing this for a long time and they've been around the block and they know what they're doing. Right? So I couldn't do that. But what I could do is I could memorize information. It's all on the internet. It's all free. And if I can then just talk about information that is about the city, about the streets, about taxes, about anything, then no one's ever going to ask me how old I am. No one's ever going to say, how long you been doing this? And no one's ever going to say, well, he was just a kid, right? Um, and I learned that the hard way. And I, I read about that story in Big Money Energy as well. It sucked. Um, but, you know, you are king of information. And that instills confidence in yourself to be able to talk, which then instills confidence in others who work with you. And then that's how you can actually get deals done, especially in situations where you're going on a reach, Right. And I think my whole career has always been about, I don't ever want to do the same thing every year. Right. Like I could sell small apartments in the financial district of New York city all day, every day, but life is short. Why do I don't want to do that. Right? One day I want to sell something for over a hundred million dollars. That would be crazy. And so I've been thinking about it and manifesting that deal since I got into the business for 12, you know, yeah, 12 years ago, um, took me 12 years but it finally happened. And I knew when I was talking to him, I knew what I had to do, which is I need to study, memorize information. And when I'm there, I 
am the go-to for info. And so when we're ready, like I don't, I'm not going to say, oh, hey, let me check comps or let me think about it. Let me go talk to my partner. Let me, let me get a referral broker in here. Let me call my manager. No, all of that is bullshit. You're being hired for you. They're paying a commission because of you. So when he said, I was being a little bit funny before, but in real life, when he put me up against the wall, he's like, where's this get done? I said, 120, thereabouts. No blinking. He said, did I know that it gets done at 120? Fuck no. Did I think, did I, did I have any comps for this place? Absolutely not. No. But was I going to stumble in front of somebody who like, no, no, 120. And then it goes higher. That's okay. All right. I thought we could get it for 120. Turns out there's a lot of interest, right? A lot of people are moving to Florida because of taxes right now and because of the political environment and COVID in New York City. Yeah. Um, and that's what happened. Dude, are you opening up a brokerage in Florida? We, well, I mean, we're in New York City now um, uh, and we are, we just leased our new office. So we got to build that out first. We're in the middle of doing that now. Once that's all set up, our, our next markets are going to be South Florida and the Hamptons, just where our current clients are. And yes, then we're going to branch from there. I love it. Well, Rocha Fabio from Portugal says, hello. She has a question for you. Hi. She says, how, how does he have all this time to do it all? My mind is blown. <laughs> I have a really, 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 really amazing team. I learned a long time ago, there's only so many minutes in the day. It's not even hours, right? It's minutes. How many minutes do you have? We have a thousand minutes every day to make the absolute most of your day and to push your goals forward. So I need to make sure that I only spend those minutes doing what I can do, which is like being with that client, right? Slash being here with you guys doing this, this live. Um, everything else can be handled by other people. And I'm okay making less money if that means I get to do more business and more volume. I don't care, right? As long as I do the work, the work is gonna take care of us and I wanna sell as much as possible. Um, so you can't do everything on your own. Like right now in our temporary townhouse that we're in in Tribeca because we had to get out of our last brokerage and move under the cover of darkness in the middle of a pandemic when you weren't supposed to be leaving your house, um, I'm at a dining table surrounded by four women who run the business. Like I, I, I bring in the business, I negotiate, I focus on brand 90% of the day, everything else gets done by four super women that I surround myself with amongst everybody else in the company. And that's how, that's how I, that's how I balance. Right? If you Just want to, if people are listening in and they want to watch how you structured your new brokerage, there's one video where you announced Sir Hant that outlines that and i'm going to put it in the in the link that is a great video of where brokerages should be looking to pivot to you did such a great job on that one man thank you the one where i where i dressed up as super yeah we, <laughs> you jumped oh my gosh that was so good you were super sir hand that was a great I one it. hey i want to dig into the book for a minute um which by the way if you haven't read it or you haven't gotten it go to bigmoneyenergy.com check it out it's a lot of fun to read and I was texting with Tristan earlier. I'm like, dude, I always learn so much from Ryan's book just because, you know, every, every instance in the book, like we can relate to something we've gone through in our business and in our life. Yeah. Um, and you say in the book, and I found this very powerful, while you can't change your situation, the one thing you can change is your energy and wealthy people have a wealthy energy about them, right? So you had to kind of match that earlier on in your career when you were just starting out. I was watching, I heard of uh, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, um, say that when he was a kid, he, he would play the gimmick, right? Which is sort of like the same thing, like faking it till you make it. Do you think that, is that essentially what, you, what you're talking about? Like you were kind of faking it till you, till you were making it, like meeting with these rich people, selling them these houses, you didn't really know much about these million dollar homes. How do we navigate through that? And how did you navigate through that? Loaded, great question. Yeah, yeah I know, I'm it, sorry about that. <laughs> it, I couldn't change my circumstances, right? I lived in the apartment I lived in, I couldn't afford more. I was born in Texas, not in New York City, so I can't change that, right? I didn't really have any friends or any connections or any network in New York, so I couldn't change that either. Um, and I was 23, I couldn't get older. So what can I change? I could change. My, my energy, and if you can control your energy, okay, for the clientele that you're looking to work with, you can control your life. 
at least the trajectory of your life, right? So I, I was very well aware that low energy meant low rent, meant low income, okay? Because you can't get anything done if you have low energy or if you bring a low energy attitude to the table or if you go to drinks with friends or clients and you're the low energy one, right? Now, listen, some people are low energy and are incredibly successful like Elon Musk. So if you're Elon Musk, <laughs> Thank you very much for being here with us on this live. Um, to everybody else, okay, um, you need to be high energy. Okay? You need to be able to have vocal inflection. You need to be able to uh, impress with an image of success, even if you don't have it, because you know you will have it. So I never faked it till I, till I made it. Like faking it till you make it is BS money energy, right? That's showing up in a car that you can't afford, living in a basement, right? That's telling people that you close this, 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 but you never really did. Like that's, that's faking it. For me, once you start to understand that you have the power to harness your own energy, to attract success, okay, to adjust your mindset, um, you understand that you can assume the role of the person you want to become in order to become that person. So, I wanted to be a big real estate broker when I first, when I first, when I realized when I was doing this, um, uh, that, you know what, I can actually do this. Like I did one deal uh, I read about it in the book with a, with a Chinese woman investor who bought an apartment for a fetus, an unborn baby. Yep. Um, and I met her yes. on the internet and she flew in and I, I kind of had that light bulb moment of, you know what, I'm going to show her that I'm the broker that I want to be in five years. I'm going to know everything. I'm going to have a driver. I'm going to, I'm going to be wearing a suit. Like I'm going to be the broker that she thinks she's flying here to meet. And guess what? She doesn't know anyone here. She's from China. Um, and that's what I did. And I sold her that apartment for $2.1 million at 3 AM at the St. Regis hotel with curly fries. Cause she was hungry and jet lagged and pregnant. Um, and I carried that through as I then built my career of, I can be the person I want to be in the future. Right. And I can project that into the person I am today. So I don't need to wait for 10 years. I feel like a lot of people just end up waiting. Well, I can't go on that pitch because I haven't done any deals on that block. Or I can't go meet with that client or developer. Ryan, I've never done new development. What are they going to say? I don't know what to say. My palms are sweaty. Yeah. Like you, you, you got to get out of your own way and stop being afraid of your own shadow. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations and be totally confident in what you're about to talk about. So what? You've never done new development. You can Google what a new development is. You can understand who that home builder is. You can understand how to build a damn new house. You can know the market and you can show up and you can say, you're the best broker for new development there is. You've got plenty of buyers. You've been doing this for this long, blah, 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 blah. And all the builder's going to care about is selling the damn house. <laughs> like they don't care about anything else. And you can totally change your life. I know I'm going on a tangent, but um, you can totally, totally, totally change your life that way. And I think you well, can end up controlling your own fate. Right. Dude, that, that goes into that story you were telling where you called up, where you were trying to find a $20 million listing <laughs> because you promised Bravo you had one coming up. Can you talk <laughs> about that and talk about the cold calling part too? Because that, that was like, whoa, he cold called too? Now you're speaking my well, language. Before you talk about that, I just want to say Ryan Serhant cold called. Okay. So if you don't think people like Ryan do, they do <laughs> or did at some point, right? Yeah, I so haven't I called love... yeah, I haven't called, called in a while. What I do now though, I'll, so I'll tell you that story in one second, but what I do now, um, that people probably don't think that I do, every single day I send cold messages. I will either cold email, cold DM, or if I can get your cell phone, I'll cold text you. I go after, you know, like so target marketing, right? I'll go after the wealthy people. I can get all their information on LinkedIn. Thank you, LinkedIn. Um, and then I go after their circle of trust because I don't, I don't have time to build trust with you for 15 years so that you'll trust me, <laughs> but you trust this person in the outer circle. You've been working yeah. with them for 15 years. And when you mention to them that you're thinking about buying or selling a home, I want that person to say, do you know, Ryan? No, I don't. You should meet him. I need that relationship to happen. So I do that throughout the day. 
Like I send cold messages. All, like I, I can't show you my other, my screen because I'm in my screen, but we got an Excel sheet that sits here. And when I get a moment or someone else in on our table here, we'll come over and we send cold emails. Right now we're like ripping through um, uh, cold emails to billionaires, right? We found, uh, we found like 350 emails of billionaires and I'm cold emailing them all. He said, hey, I just sold this house for $132 million. Not sure why you don't have one. <laughs> you know what, Ryan, can I just say, and, and, and I know Tristan had a question, but there's so many takeaways here. Like anyone can do that. Literally yeah. anyone can. Yeah, listen, whatever market you're in, wherever you are in the world, what is the industry that is buying and selling homes? Is it the local university? Is it the local hospital? Is it local banks? Is it, you know, tech, wh wh whatever it is. Is it oil and gas? Is it farming? Figure out how to reach those people and you go after all of them, right? All of them, because guess what? People in that industry, they all talk to each other and they want to use who he uses and he uses and he uses. That's why a lot of brokers end up doing like the same types of deals over and over because they kind of get in with that company or in with that certain section of people. That's why the wealthy, right? The wealthy all stick together okay, because they can complain to each other. <laughs> yeah, that's really important to learn. That's like, when I learned that, that changed a lot for me, right? People stick to, to, stick to groups that they are comfortable bitching and moaning in. So poor people will complain to other poor people, right? Because you will have the same problems. Middle income will complain to middle income because they have the same problems. And rich people feel uncomfortable talking about their third car that broke down or their guest house that wasn't clean or their private jet that wasn't gassed up and fueled when they needed to go. And so they had to take commercial. Like they, those sound like ridiculous problems and they are. But when you're at that level, those are real problems. They're fucking annoying. And you want to bitch and moan about them. And so you do it to other rich people. And so then you take those referrals from other wealthy people. So I made sure early on, and I want to put myself in the position to allow wealthy people to complain to me. So wherever wealthy people go to complain, they can complain to me all day long. And I'm going to take it and I'm going to be empathetic. Even if it's inside my head, I'm saying, holy shit, are you really, really? To them, I totally get it. Totally, totally get it because then they're going to come to me for good things too, which is, Hey, I got to buy my daughter an apartment. She's graduating college. What does a new college kid need to like, like 70 million, right? I want to be there for that conversation. I mean, I, we all want rich people to complain to us. So go out there and get those rich people to complain to you guys. Yeah, Listen, it's, that's what we need. It's, it's real. So I'll go back to the cold call thing for one second. I, I was auditioning for million dollar listing. Um, I go, to, I, I, I've never really told the whole story about how I got on that show. I think a lot of people just assume I was doing real. I wasn't, I was in the business for like 18 months. I was renting apartments, uh, in Koreatown for 2000 a month. And I had got onto one building. So I was the sales agent for one building in the financial district. Um, that was really, really hard. And that was it. That was, that was my career, right? I lived in a tiny studio. Um, uh, no one knew me. And I showed up to an audition with 3000 people. Um, uh, and you know, I got through, I told them that I was the best. They believed me. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, they never asked me anything else, right? They then, I kind of went on to the next audition, et cetera. Um, and they asked, you know, what kind of listings would I have at the beginning of the show, right? If we were to start filming with you, Ryan, tomorrow, um, you know, what kind of listings could we expect from you? And so I'm reading that as like, okay, now they're checking my resume. Um, they probably went on my, my website and saw that I had zero listings except for that one building. So listen, if I get cast on this, future Ryan, whenever that is, he's going to have a $20 million listing because he needs one. Because I think that's what's going to help me get on the show. So I told them, I've got a $20 million listing downtown coming up. And they said, okay, wow. Um, uh, and then we go forward, go forward, go forward. And then they actually cast me. And then they're ready to film. So then I'm like, well, shit. I guess this is real now in game time. So I started cold calling um, wealthy people in Soho and Tribeca, uh, where I could get their information, calling them at work. Um, and I started reaching out to expireds and nothing was working. I wasn't really getting anyone. And then I saw in the New York Post, 
um, an article about a guy who had a huge penthouse in Soho on Green Street, um, who was in a lawsuit with his board. Okay. And they were really trying to kick him out. He was this uh, cool photographer kind of guy. Um, and so I, uh, so I, for so, sorry. So I, um, uh, so I reached out to him because I got his information because it was on his photography website. So I called him, said, Hey, my name is Ryan Serhant. Um, I see you're having issues with your building. I'd love to help you sell the apartment. And I put it in the book, but he was like, uh, never talk to me, never call me again and hung up the phone. Okay. Um, and so instead of taking that as a no, right? Anytime someone says no, you just call back and ask the same question in a different way. Okay. So I called back and I said, um, Hi, sorry, I don't think you heard me. I'm about to be on one of the biggest reality TV shows ever. And it's a real estate show. And I could feature your apartment and we could sell it as a big fuck you to your board that's suing you and putting your name in the paper. <laughs> and he agreed to meet. And so we met and got the listing. He traumatized me. That deal was awful. Um, I learned a lot about wealthy people and their problems on that one but we filmed that deal if you if you ever go back to season one of million dollar list in new york it's 95 green street it was a motorcycle in the living room i had a huge party um it was the most stressful i lost like 20 pounds that season because i was so stressed. i actually i and think he, i saw that episode now that i'm thinking about it yeah, yeah it, was, it. it was completely insane um and uh we got an offer for 19.8 we filmed it um and then it died and then I sold like his, there was a neighboring apartment for 3 million that I sold, um, uh, but never sold the big one. And it, it ended up going to foreclosure or something like that. Um, wow. But that was, it's that was that. Though. Yeah. Such a good story. Yeah, Dude. man. Anything is, listen, I, I, I am such a strong believer in the power of positive energy. And I believe mm -hmm. that if you think about the future in a negative light, you are going to predict the future and the future is not bright. Right? So why would I do that? Why wouldn't I just get excited about the future? You know, someone asked me earlier, they said, Ryan, how do you stay so motivated? Right? You're always so energized, so motivated. Aren't you busy? Don't you miss your family? Like, how do you stay motivated? And to be honest, when I wake up every day, I'm not motivated about today because today's going to happen. It's already here. It just showed up. I'm now in it. I'm motivated to get through today so I can get to tomorrow because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm pumped. The best deal I've ever done, I haven't done yet. Right? The best client I've ever had, I don't know who it is. That's awesome. And so I'm super excited about the future, which is why I live for, for me, I live for Ryan 2030. That's the guy I work for. Right? Ryan 2030. I'm going to be him before I know it. I want to make sure that everything I put in now right, is going to make his life better. Because when I get there, I want life to be good. The same way today, I don't give a shit about what my Friday was like in February, 2011. Like, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> you know, I, I think it was probably fine. Actually, it was probably kind of stressful. Um, but I'm glad I was doing the work that I was doing then. And I know it was a grind uh, because it's, it's helped me get to where I am today. Yeah. So if you reframe the way you think about life and the way you think about your attitude and your energy that way, all you're going to do, man, is you are going to predict your own future and it's going to be bright. Dude, uh, we have over 100 oh. questions, but I'm going to pick one yeah, because it relates to, to your previous book by Antonio. He says, do you still keep to the same day-to-day -day plan you had originally implemented in the first book? Yeah. Yeah, so Finder, Keeper, Doer um, is my lifeblood. Uh, I'm a big believer in routine. Case in point, even during quarantine, okay, New York City got shut down on March 22nd. We left the city, went to New Hampshire on March 18th because every police officer was saying they were going to shut down the bridges and tunnels and like the city was going to become a Will Smith movie. Um, so we got out and the easiest thing for me to do would be to drop my routine, right? Like not wake up early, like, holy shit, the world's coming to an end. What am I going to do? Oh man, oh man, Netflix, you know, Tiger King, all the things. Um, uh, but instead, uh, I, I knew that that wouldn't make me happy. Uh, and what would make me happy is if I could come out of quarantine or whatever that shit is going on right now with something to show for it. Um, so I'm going to keep my routine. So I, in New Hampshire, in the woods, freezing my ass off, I woke up at four because that's the time I wake up when I'm in the city, Sunday through Friday. Instead of going to a cool gym, 
I ran around a lake, which sucked, um, in the snow, which just sucked even more. Um, uh, it's not like I enjoy this stuff. I do it because it's the job. Okay. Right. I get, I get back. I wake up to get the baby at seven o'clock. Instead of going to the office, I go to the garage and that's where I worked for the month that we were in New Hampshire, completely locked away. Um, and I follow finder, keeper, doer every day. So for me now, and I write about this in book one, um, when you start in the business, your day is mostly dominated by doer time. And what you're trying to do is get yourself to a point in your career when 90% of your day can be finder time, which is finding new business, prospecting, right? Going after new deals, building your brand. And so I still do that. I've got FKD in my calendar. I mean, it's been there since uh, 2011. Yeah, it's been there since 2011. Um, and I just, it just reminds me now as muscle memory what my job is. My job is to generate new business every day. I should also remind myself to keep all my current business, <laughs> to take care of it, think about the money, advertise marketing, and I actually got to do stuff too. Um, but it's, it's really the only way that I know how to be a entrepreneur working for myself every day. Otherwise, you're going to run around and be busy, busy, busy. And before you know it, you're the same person you are today in 2030. And that's not okay. Yeah, Ryan, you know, <clears throat> um, speaking of the we're going along on that on that uh, trajectory there, you a lot of people would think, oh, you know, Ryan Serhan, you know, he's on TV, doesn't need to really do any prospecting. The business just comes to him. And, you know, I've heard you say that that's actually not true. I mean, I'm sure there's instances where, yes, someone lists with you because they know who you are. But I think um, that primarily that's not the case. And so somebody, Arena Patar uh, in the chat has a great question. She's from Summit, New Jersey. Um, she wants to know, you know, how often do you keep in touch with your sphere of influence? Like how many times a year do you get in front of them through, you know, cards, phone calls, text messages? What's that look like for you? Mm -hmm. So I have my immediate list that I talk to all the time, but I've built a pretty good system where I stay in front of my people through email a lot um, and texts a lot. Um, you know, I have three newsletters and I blast my entire network anytime there's something really important. So like, hey, just sold the second most expensive home in the United States ever. I let all of my people know that last, that was last Thursday. Um, you know, uh, New York Magazine just wrote a profile on me on Monday this week. So I let my entire network know that as well. Um, you know, we just signed, we just took down Tommy Hilfiger's old flagship store in Soho, 15,000 square foot building in the middle of Soho. Um, no real estate brokerage office has that kind of thing anywhere in New York City. And it's completely insane because the city is like a complete mess and people aren't here. So I did that like a lunatic. And so I sent that to everybody. So I remind people, you know, and through social, I try to encourage everyone I work with, follow me on social. Um, but I, I, I know who my VIPs are. I reach out to them all the time. Um, and, and at the end of every year, I do a, a Sirhant Moleskin. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a Sirhant Moleskin um, uh, to everybody is like a closing gift um, for yeah. the year, like a closing year gift. Um, and I send out a ton of those. So that's like my, my gift. That's super cool. Well, I like that. I don't, gift, think, I don't think my clients would, I don't think it would go over the same way if I, if I did one. What do you think, Tristan? <laughs> Let's give it a shot. Red and had a beard. All right, Ryan, question for you. Scott says, I read both books and he loves them a lot. In your second book, you said you eat from 12 to six. And yeah. how does that go with the workout and your schedule? Can you go through that? Yeah, I have a, my body naturally has a kind of a slow metabolism. If you met my dad, he's 6'6", 260, big guy. Um, and I saw when I turned 30 that my metabolism, my, my metabolism started to slow down. Um, and I just started putting on like weight and I just didn't like it. Uh, and, you know, I tried dieting, working out even more, the whole thing. And then... I guess it was three years ago now. Yeah. Um, uh, I met someone who talked to me about intermittent fasting and I'd heard about it before, but I thought it was always bullshit and stupid and just another fad. Um, and he really explained it to me as, listen, your body is a car. Okay. 
when you put fuel in your body, you better be ready to go drive and use it. If you're not going to use it and it's just going to sit there, your car is just going to store most of that fuel for tomorrow, right? Because it's like, well, I'm going to use this eventually when we go driving. But then if you show up tomorrow and you give it even more fuel, your body's like, wait, but we had, but the, oh, uh, okay, give me more. Okay, fine, 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 fine. I guess it's coming down. And I don't know what it was about that analogy, but I was like, oh shit, that's right. Interesting. Um, uh, and it's just like so simple to think about. And so I started just, you know, I would, I stopped eating at eight and I, you know, um, I would just not eat from like eight to eight. And I started that and it like kind of did a little bit. But then I, I did the 18 six, which is I work out in the mornings. Okay, which is, you know, no matter what I do, it's fat burning because now I'm on no food and I eat from 12 to 6, Sunday through Friday. Um, and I, I will tell you, the first couple of weeks, you hate everyone and everything, but you adapt to it. And if you can get through it, um, like the first 10 to 14 days, I, I, don't, I don't have any need for coffee anymore. Like I have more energy than ever. Um, it's probably because I'm always hungry, you know, um, uh, but it's, but it works, you know, and it helps me look better, feel better. Um, and that way I'm also not thinking about food all the time, right? Food then becomes a game. It's like, all right, I get to eat breakfast when everyone else is eating, eating lunch. This is fun. And then at six, I'll always like inhale a snack or something just as like my last ditch, like Indiana Jones grab of the hat. I'm like, all right, six o'clock, we made it. And then on Saturdays, I go back to being little Ryan, the fat kid, and I crush food on Saturdays. You got to crush I, something. What's your, what's your favorite? I think, I think about it all. I think about it all week. Like it gets me through the week where I'm like, Saturday's almost here. I'm going to like, I'm going to load up on, you know, I'll do like pancakes, uh, with a waffle, maybe add in a Cinnabon for it. Um, eggs, bacon, all Ooh. of like, all of like three bagels for lunch. I'll get like steak and ice oh, cream you for dinner. all day. Yeah, you man. Go all ground. Dude, go it's not just like one meal. Everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's like the rock, bro. Dude, and then by the end of the day, though, I'll tell you, I do not want to ever eat again. And I do this to myself every week. And listen, I don't know. It works for me. <laughs> so Yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. Usually there's a cheap meal. He's, talk, he's talking about a cheat, an entire cheat day. Hey, um, I want to just jump into um, a, a question I had uh, uh, that, I, that I found really interesting that you mentioned this in the book. Uh, because you know, people will see the, the the title of the book, like "Big Money Energy." Oh, this book is all about you know, just like rich, being rich, and, and there's nothing, there's nothing else to life, and that's that's the complete opposite of what this book is about. And I love what you said that um, that there are three important components to success. It's not fancy cars, big houses, or private jets. You say it's authenticity, kindness, and likability. Unfortunately that's can be very hard to meet people with all three of those traits, you know, especially now. So how did you find, cause you mentioned a million dollar listing. They wanted, they didn't want likable and kind. They wanted loud and obnoxious, right? So like, how did you get the, the, the real impression of Ryan out to your actual customers when during the first season, they maybe didn't portray you that way? Um, I said, I, I never really changed who I am, how I talk, how I interact. You know, I've, I've always just tried to be as genuine as I possibly can. I mean, I think you guys can see in the four times we've spoken, like I, I'm an open book. I'll tell you whatever you want. You know, I, 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 I don't, I don't really care. You know, um, on the show, remember they film with us for a year, season nine that we're filming right now, by the time the show comes out this spring, we will have filmed that show for two years. So, wow. uh, because COVID shut us down for five months, but we filmed through COVID on our phones. So it's like Whoa. insanity. And so they edit it however they want to edit it. You know, they edit it in LA. We have no control over anything. We are just hired guns. Um, and so I just made sure that I worked my ass off. Super nice, super humble. Like I was always taught growing up and just let the work speak for itself. Um, and I think like, if you look at the New York Magazine article that just came out, like they they interviewed some of my clients and they said like, listen, Ryan, like, you know, believe the hype. Um, he's not a reality TV show guy. He's actually incredibly hardworking who happens to be on a reality TV show. Um, mm -hmm. 
and that made me feel good because I'm like, all right, good, fuckers, you you notice. <laughs> You know, Ryan, like that's, that's important for agents to realize because, you know, now with certain um, entities, you know, doing a bait and switch on a lot of, a lot of real estate agents and becoming a brokerage, you know, everyone's freaking out, but really what it comes down to is man, people work with people that they really like, yeah. you know, so just be nice and kind, honestly, and have all the information. Listen, people want to work with people they like, right? They want to work with people they can complain to, but they also want to work with people they like. Right. You know, the conversations that I have with someone who's buying something for $30 million, you know, are, are not that different from someone who's buying something for 300,000. Yes. They're different people. Yes. Life is different. They can afford different things. They're blessed. I, all that stuff. But the concern about the windows, the roof, like the concern about, are they spending too much? The concern, even at that level, like being able to afford, you know, some of these guys, like they're stretching too. Um, even though, you know, even though the purchase price is so, is so large. And so the conversations don't really change. My tactics just kind of change, right? Like I, I play to the wealthy's ego more than I would uh, across any other price point, right? Um, uh, you know, and I, and I, you know, you play to the compliments, you play to, you know, what they, what they do well at because they kind of need that a little bit, um, which, which is fine, right? It's just part of the game. You know, there's a really good question, and it's a very short question. It's li literally five questions. Do you have a coach? No, no, I never had a mentor. I never had a coach, um, uh, which is a big part of why we started the Sell Like Sirhan course, um, because I couldn't, I couldn't find a coach who does the business that I do at the volume that I do that moves as fast as I do. What I found were a bunch of coaches who were really good coaches right? <laughs> and it just, it, it just didn't work for me. Um, yeah. uh, so yeah. what I wanted to do was start a course and I, that I, listen, it's not, I'm not, I don't need to do any of this stuff. I just yeah. really yeah. like salespeople and I really like real estate agents and we're not going away until Bezos figures out how to have a house sell itself to another house. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we're only getting more powerful and stronger, especially in the markets that we're in right now. Um, and so I, I was like, all right, if I'm getting into this business or if I've been in this business for a couple of years, or I just want to do better and I'm looking for like a mentor or a coach or, or a course, who would I want to learn from? I'd want to learn from the guy that's like the best in the business. Like, how did you do it? Right? Like if I'm playing basketball, I don't want like Bob, the coach, want, it would be really, really cool to see like LeBron or somebody not, I'm not comparing myself to them. I'm just saying like, I, you know, I'm an agent all day, every day. Like I am cold emailing all day, every day. I'm on appointments, I'm in showings and we sell a lot of real estate. And so I can speak to the agents and our members every day about the same exact business. And they know that I'm in it with them. I'm not here to be anybody's guru. I'm here to experience this insane business all around the world with them and refer deals, you know, and do the whole thing. Go to Sarahant. Go to Sarahant.com if you want to check out. Uh, is that the, where the class is? Or is that yeah, the, Ryan? Is Ryan that the, you know what? The broker just Sirhan. You go to ryansirhan.com slash course. Um, okay. Ryansirhan.com slash course. We'll we'll throw it in the in the chat there and on Facebook. Hey, um, we just dumped it in there for you. It's a great question because everybody's talking about Zillow every other month here. Yeah. How do you see it with Zillow? Are they? How do they compete against agents? How do agents compete against Zillow? What's your take? So fortunately in, in the cities, right? We don't have to compete against Zillow. It would just be way too expensive for them. Um, you know, we end up dealing with them on the lead gen side and, and, and all of that. But I would say, listen, there are, it's not just Zillow, right? There's tons of other discount firms and there's tons of other iBuyers buyers um, and they're not going away now. And so you have to pivot, right? Your pitch is uh, in explaining to people how those companies work and how the offers really work and how you believe very strongly that you can sell their home for more money because you can control the process. Whereas the iBuyer is just going to come in and give you that number. Now, if you want to undersell your house, to be honest, you don't need me. Go for it. Call them up. I'll give you the number. I got a really good person at Zillow. Like they'll buy your house tomorrow, right? Or whatever firm. But if you want to get as much money as you can for the house and you want a real salesperson to get it done, 
because you put your blood, sweat, and tears into building this place or your babies made their first footsteps here, whatever it might be, then you need the best in the business. And that's, and that's me. So it's totally up to you. Um, and that's one conversation that you can have with people. It, it depends on what their individual motivations are. Um, but listen, like I, you know, I was a pure listing agent who would do buyers if I had time for, for 11 years, right? COVID hit and I've done more buy side deals in, in, in New York, but also Florida in different States that I've never been in, in the last year while also starting up a new firm while also, you know, writing a book because you got to pivot, like you got to pivot, stay flexible, right? The average days on market in New York city is 400. Crazy. So with the buyers that you have, you the, have the ability to get good deals done. So that's what I'm reaching out to all these billionaires with. It's, it's you know, if you want to buy elsewhere, let's go. If you want to get a, the best deal you've ever gotten in New York City, let's go. I'm the guy. Hey, Ryan, if you ever want to open a brokerage in Michigan, in Royal Oak, that's where I am. There's a million dollar price. Million dollar price. I've got a map up here with a big red X on Royal Oak. It's right there. I know, right there. Royal Oak, Bloomfield Hills. Million dollar price point, man. Come on. We you know, we got we got the Pistons, we got the Lions and Tiger. You know, we can we can clean it up here with with sports. That's a 2022 um, Ryan Serhant. Um, yeah, yeah. Bolt right the there. Michigan Michigan team. Yeah, that's got a lot. Of, that's very sexy. Uh, what I was gonna say before we wrap up because it has to do with something that you just mentioned, um, and, and 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 Zillow and 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 such and things like that. One of my biggest takeaways was on page two, 104. S. I'm gonna give you a specific page. 104. Are you sure it wasn't you 102? Wanna, yeah, one, no, no, it was 104. 100, wait, 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 wait. I don't have to look at 104 is uh, um, the artist selective communication. Is it the $40 million blanket? Ah, yes. <laughs> that is good. But there's one quote. Wow, you know your book, dude. That's really amazing. Dude. I wrote this shit, man. Yeah, what do you think, do you think I am? Frederick Eklund with the ghostwriter? <laughs> no, I actually use my fingers. <laughs> I know. Last question. You that just answered it, Ryan. Right? So good. Um, if this is what I love this quote, if you want to convince someone to spend more, never focus on the money, focus on the value. Um, yeah. And that, you know, can be taken a lot of different ways, but um, you know, it, it, with, with what you were just talking about in terms of Zillow, the value is us. The information is us, you know, the, the relationship is us. So push that forward. Um, oh, yeah. And listen, a lot of people write books. They don't know what's on every page. You know what I mean? But it was great. I love that. Um, well, we appreciate you being here, man. Go get the book, Big Money Energy. Can you answer one last question? What's the main difference? People that read Sell It Like Sirhan, what's the main difference between the two books? Mm -hmm. So Sell It Like Sirhan is my toolkit for how to sell and how to build a sales career. It is everything that I know about how to structure your day, how to build that career, how to talk to buyers, how to talk to sellers, everything, right? How did you follow up? It is my tactical guide. But I was missing one thing in the book. Um, and everyone really let me know it. And I got lots of outreach from people over the last two years since the book came out in 2018 saying, listen, Ryan, your book has really, really helped me. It's really changed things for me. Um, I, have, I have better, you know, structure my day. I close this deal, that deal. Um, I, I know what to do, but I'm nervous. I know what to do. You gave me all the tools, um, but my, my, I have a pit in my stomach uh, or I have imposter syndrome or I'm too young or I'm too old or I'm too this or I'm too that, right? Or if only, if only, if only. Uh, big money energy is the secret sauce. And what it really is, is big magnetic energy. The book is everything I know about how to adjust your mindset so that you can actually start attracting success to you. And just like we said before, if you can't change your circumstances overnight, which we can't, there's one thing you can change, which is your energy. And if you change your energy, you can change your life. And so it's that secret sauce that allows you to then go use those tools and put those tools to work and go build, right? And do more and sell more um, and have that confidence even when you don't have the confidence. That's the difference. I love it. So good. <laughs> Everyone loves Thanks. your energy, Ryan. Great job, man. Always, always on, always on point. Well, appreciate you being back here, man, for a fourth time. 
Um, it's an honor and we're, we're humbled every single time you, you agree to jump on with us. And uh, this was a good one, dude. I'm going to have to watch this back a couple of times. Yeah, I know. I was taking notes. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> You guys Ryan, thanks, buddy. Go get the book, everyone. What's that? You guys are the best. Thank you so much for having me. You're awesome, dude. Go to big, go to bigmoneyenergy.com. Get the book. You know, throw them a bone. Get the book. Read something. It's good for you. Yeah, or listen to it. The audio book, the ebook. Really good. Yeah. Oh, listening to it. That would be good because it's you read it, I would assume. So no, I think he hired Frederick to read it, right, Ryan? Wow. Oh, Oh wow! Actually, this is this is a very important client. I told him to call me three three. I gotta take this. I'll see you guys. Bye.